Good afternoon, our watchers, our audience members, and our listeners. Um, I am your host for today, and uh, it must be quite fun. You, you never know who you're going to get from one day to the next when Nicholas is on leave. But what I'm going to do, other than welcome my guests, Marius Root. Hi, Marius. Hi, Sarah. How's it, Kerry? And Kerry Van Yeden. Hi, Kerry. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Right, and we're essentially going to pick up on, up on a bit of a theme, and that is the possibility of having the worst public sector boss in the country, and that is Pravin Gordon. Now, I know that um, Herman very eloquently um, lost things a bit yesterday with regard to his non-comment comments on the progress in at South African Airways. Today, we're really going to look at the two issues, the, the other two issues that he's involved in that I think is sending things into a sort of a bit of a chaotic spin. And the one is that he's come down like a ton of bricks on the board of ESCOM for only putting forward one name for potential CEO of ESCOM when they should have put forward three. And the board is getting very, very upset about this because... I think they felt that they were doing things correctly. And in any event, they put forward this name in May. And it's taken until now for the esteemed minister to come back and say, no, you've done it all wrong. Come back with some more. Um, this, you know, I, I kind of think that if he felt that one wasn't enough in May, he could have just picked up the phone and say, guys, please give me two more names. Um, but apparently not. So, Marius, what do you think is actually going on here? I mean, this is just entirely bizarre. I'm not sure if ESCOM would run better with a new CEO, but surely this is storm in a teacup. I think it's obviously just the incompetence that we're used to now coming from the ANC. And obviously, ESCOM, for, its, for better or worse, is still an important organization in South Africa, and we need it to run properly. But then also it comes down to uh, Pravin Godan. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's a line in Batman, where uh, one of the Batman movies where uh, Harvey Dent, okay, Two-Face, says you either die here or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. I think that's happened to Pravin Godan. Uh, you know, when uh, he was a pretty good SARS commissioner, and he, at face value, he was an okay finance minister. But if we actually look, uh, I mean, he was obviously, I think he was the uh, first finance minister under uh, Jacob Zuma, or the second one, I can't remember. But anyway... Under uh, Pravin Godan's uh, stewardship of national treasury, that's when South African uh, government spending really got out of control. And if you look at the, you know, the kind of trend, that's really when things uh, started going a bit haywire. And while we have a lot of problems we have now today, uh, you know, spending was really out of control. And that that all came under Pravin Godan. So I think he's one of those guys. His reputation, uh, I mean, I don't think his reputation is as good as it uh, used to be. But I think people used to think he was kind of a steady hand on the tiller. I think mean, he's been he's been shown he's you know he's pretty much you know he's not he's not much more competent than most other NC cabinet ministers, and I think we can see with all the chaos that's happening with the in public enterprises and all that kind of thing, you know, it just shows that yeah maybe Pravin Pravin Godan and he's one of those guys whose reputation was uh, uh, you know reputation he had that uh, maybe didn't uh, uh, he didn't deserve. Well, I think he's suffering. He may be suffering from the problem that a lot of uh, sportsmen suffer from and that is that they retire too late um they, they would be better off having left the left the field so to speak while they still had a reputation um to defend um Harry, what morris has said has some resonance and i think it's because godan probably had a lot more independence and space to operate um in the in, the, in his earlier positions and by all accounts from what andre de Reta has said he he got on reasonably well because Gordon understood things and, and he could engage with him. But some of the rumor is that the delay with regard to the um, with regard to the appointment of the CEO has much more to do with ANC infighting, uh, cadre, cadre deployment, who, you know, who the ANC really wants there. And Gordon is just 
reflecting the frustration of being probably a bit helpless in that situation. Um, what do you think of that proposition? Yes, I, I think um, it is, uh, as you and Maria suggest, uh, 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 Gordon may have had a little bit more of independence in his previous positions, but now he's serving a, uh, as a mouthpiece for the ANC, he's reporting back to, to headquarters, and the, the delays that we've seen now for months and months is probably Gordon trying to buy some more time for, for them to kind of sort out which cadre are we going to uh, position now um, for for the newest position? And also, um, you know, Gordon still, I think, firmly believes in um, what um, his his party believes, which is uh, cen uh, central centralization. You know, um, he refuses to um, use the word unbundling because that, um, according to him, um, relates to privatization. And God forbid we have some privatization of, you know, failing state-owned entities that provide very basic services. Um, so, um, yeah, I think Gordon is just uh, another lackey still um, taking, taking orders from the, the, the ANC higher-ups. Uh, in furthering the the national democratic revolution, and uh, I think that's the the worst person to have as the minister of public <laughs> enterprises. Yeah. Well, his um his 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 ministry is going to disappear and mm -hmm. be subsumed into this new mm -hmm. um, state-owned enterprise company that's going to oversee the running of all the state-owned enterprises, which I don't think fills anyone with with much encouragement. Um, it, what it also does, of, of course, is suggest that the deeper we get into the mire, the more the ANC doubles down. And we've seen this with uh, uh, preferential procurement. We've seen this with uh, black economic empowerment it's, and, and cold air deployment. So it's, it's really, I'd say, counterintuitive to say the very least. But at the same time, um, Gordon is nagging ESCOM to get its transmission company up and running. Now, transmission was separated out, but still as an SOE from, uh, has been separated, sorry, separated out from ESCOM as an SOE. Um, and the board had intended to start operating in the, in the new financial year, which is, which is from the beginning of April. Gordon apparently has been haranguing them because that he wants it to be operating from the end of the month. Now I don't know the practicalities of that, but it's literally, it's it's almost it's schizophrenic. I mean, on the one hand, you have this huge delay from him with regarding this, with regard to the CEO ostensibly, and on the other hand, there's a pressure for transmission, which obviously has to do with getting ESCOM right or improving its performance, um, but may or may not be totally impractical. Uh, Marius, your, your views on that? Uh, I mean, I don't know what more to add. It's just, it's, uh, just as I was saying in the show uh, to Herman yesterday, the government, there's just too much talking and just needs to start doing things now. You know, that's we, we've had all these plans to fix ESCOM and everything, do, and this transmission company. But... Uh, Things just need to be, get done now. We we at a point now we, we can't have any more talk shops or policies being implemented. Things need to get fixed. I mean, yeah, where I'm sitting in Ekurileni, I've had water for three days. You know, I know that's actually not bad compared to other places, but it affects people's quality of life and so on. I mean, I'm just grateful I don't have a small kid that I have to worry about. Imagine you've got a, you know, a, don't have any water and you've got a three month old baby or whatever the case is. You know, so I think the time for talking and all this kind of thing is is over now. But we, we know that the ANC, I mean, they, they love, they, they talk a big game, you know this, but they're pretty bad at implementing anything. And we'll see, I think it's the same kind of thing that we'll see with all the classes around ESCOM. Now and again, you see things actually get done, but I think it's really at uh, crisis points. And uh, South Africa's at that point now. And we, you know, reality is going to meet ideology in South Africa very soon. And, uh, you know, maybe reality will win. I wouldn't say that it's a, 100% certain chance that ideology will win. Reality could easily win. but And where reality wins over ideology, things start going better for countries. Uh, mm -hmm. India, I think, is a good example. In the early 1990s, where they also ran out of money 
and then they started implementing free market uh, reforms. India now, 30 years later, is growing this year. It's going to grow at 7% a year, its economy. And that's a country of over a billion people. There are more people in India than the whole of Africa. So imagine how many people are being lifted out of poverty every year if you're growing at 7%. And this isn't a once-off. Since the early 90s, the average growth rate in India has been between 4 and 7%. It's phenomenal. But in other places, ideology does win out of reality. Zimbabwe, Venezuela, and we all know what's happened in those countries. So, yeah, I think uh, we, we're seeing what's happening now is, the, is a fight between reality and ideology. And, yeah, as I say, I don't think it's a done deal that ideology will win, but reality's got a hard battle in its hands, I think. Um, Harry, finally, just from Marius's point, do you think that the ANC really can only talk? It, 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 when it comes to the doing, it's like a deer in the headlights. It just cannot do, or certainly not do enough to make the difference that the that country desperately needs? Uh, I think um, the, the ANC has, um, um, because there's so many factions now and infighting and, and different interests at play within the party itself, it, it's essentially paralyzed at the moment. And um, uh, we, we can't hope for any type of reform coming from the ANC. And I think the ANC... Uh, realize that it, it can't reform and that's why it's doubling down on on many of the old things that don't work and so i think they're just essentially seeing how long they can keep this gravy train going before they they lose power so there's absolutely no um uh, motivation for them to 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 kind of improve the way things are going in south africa just what they can extract while they are in power Right. I think that's right. Um, and our next story, I'm actually going to ask Marius to lead in with it because we just picked it up before coming on air, but uh, it, it has some resonance on a whole lot of issues. Uh, Marius, this involves a an overseas lecturer at a South African university and the Department of Home Affairs. Yeah, so uh, I was reading a story about a guy called Mark Smith. Uh, he's been the director of the Stellenbosch Business School since uh, 2020. And he's actually returning to Europe. He's British, but he was living in France before he came to South Africa. Uh, he's going back. He's given up the post and he's going back to Europe because he can't get visas for his wife or his stepdaughter. And I think this is pretty telling of, uh, you know, the kind of uh, how well the South African government functions. And I think uh, there's a paragraph I'd just like to read out here uh, from the story. It's from the Financial Mail. He says, uh, it says, his experience, he says, is a microsm of the bigger picture in which home affairs makes it hard for needed skills to enter South Africa. It's a constraint on the economy. Talent is being lost as skilled people leave and can't bring in, in anyone to replace them. It's something we have to reflect on. And I think that's very true. We all know, I mean, everybody listening here probably knows, uh, you know, quite a few people who've gone overseas for better opportunities and so on. And in general, these are obviously skilled people and people with money. Those are the kind of people we need in South Africa. But if they don't have op uh, opportunities in this country, they'll leave. And we, we need skills in South Africa, whether it's homegrown skills or skills from abroad. And we're making it hard for skills to come here. So even Mark Smith, it seems that it was fairly easy for him to get a visa to come work in South Africa. But then was the issue of his wife and his stepdaughter. And you can't expect people to come work in uh, this country and not bring their families over. And in that story in the Financial Mail, there's also a story about uh, a guy who was going to be the head of the Wits Business School, uh, a guy from India. And he'd accepted the post and everything, was going to come over. But then his daughter didn't get a student visa. So he decided to stay in India and carry on working there instead of coming to South Africa. And just shows you it's one of these, it's also, visas is also one of these things. The South African government has been talking for years, literally years, about how they're going to make it easier for foreigners to come work here and skilled people to come. And, you know, and we, we're also going to have these uh, kind of uh, digital nomad visas we've been talking about, make it easy, especially since COVID, where a lot of people can work from home. And South Africa, especially the Cape, is perfect. But the same time zone as Europe, good weather, you know, all, all the kind of things that South Africa is known for, or the nice things South Africa is known for. But where, where are we with that? You know, it's, it's nowhere. And I think this is just my cosm of what's happening in South Africa. It's just the simple incompetence, really. And you'd think... People would like, well, okay, this is a skilled guy. He's working at a you know big, well-known university. Let's help him get his family over there. But they couldn't do it. I mean, uh, in this article, um, uh, Smith's stepdaughter is uh, apparently autistic. He said he found a great school for her in Stellenbosch that he would have liked to uh, have her to attend. And he said he, he found the support in South Africa for people with, with autism better than in France, where he was living. 
But now he's obviously decided, well, he doesn't really have much of a choice. He's decided to go back to France, and you can't blame the guy. And, you know, uh, one tends to go with the maxim of don't attribute to malice what can be attributed to incompetence um, or stupidity, I'm not sure, but or both. But sometimes I do, I do wonder because I think there's a there's a fundamentally strange inability, despite in, taking into account everything else, of the failure to see that such a thing as granting these visas is literally no skin off anybody's nose. It, it's not as if it would suddenly, to you know, create a firestorm of political problems in South Africa. It's it's a they're private issues. No one is being no one else is being done out of a job. And if he's the best man for the job, he can only benefit the country. But so there's that on the one hand. And on the other hand, as Harry said in our discussion um, earlier, there is probably nothing worse than a trip to home affairs, generally speaking. It can take years off. It, it, basically, those are hours that are lost to you that will never be regained. And that that has a... An utterly dispiriting experience. I mean, our colleague Alex Weiss went to Home Affairs for four and a half hours just to collect a passport. Not to apply for one, not to do something odd or unusual, but literally to collect a passport that had already been issued. Harry, what do we do? The, the, the Minister of Home Affairs says he hasn't got enough people. Um, and the question is, does he not have enough people or does he not have enough skilled people? Um, I think it might be a little bit of both, but I think um, skills and competency is something that has really plagued home affairs officers for, for years. And what, what is especially um, concerning for me is, um, you know, I work with a lot of statistics over at the Center for Risk Analysis. And um, when we look at our demographics figures, if we zoom in, for example, at the Eastern Cape province, the Eastern Cape province demographic profile is basically a, a, a hourglass figure. So you've got a lot of old people at the top and then you've got a lot of young people at the bottom. But in the middle, you don't have... Um, young adults um, who mostly pay tax or contribute to the labor force. And that's because these young um, professionals have migrated to the Western Cape, to Gauteng, where there are better economic opportunities, where you can have better schools for your children, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but my concern is, so, so, so what I'm saying is, is that the Eastern Cape is has a huge skills deficit because mm -hmm. it's such a badly run province. But I, th my concern is that South Africa as a whole is going to start to emulate the, the demographics profile in the Eastern Cape because we're already seeing a high immigration rate of skilled South Africans leaving the country. And we might, um, over a few years, we may end up with a country with a lot of old people at top not contributing to the, the country economically, and a lot of young people also dependent on child support grants um, uh, and the like and on the state. Um, because essentially, our policies are keeping young people um, unskilled, uneducated, locked out of the labor market, but our policies are also preventing um, skilled professionals from abroad to come in and contribute more uh, to the economy and create employment for locals. Because if you can have like a, a, a rich French person or Canadian come here, start a, a medium-sized business, they can, you know, employ local South Africans as well. But um, what, what now? You know, we, we don't want to grow our own skills. We don't want to attract skills. So what, what now? I don't know. Well, I think there's an element of it's a combination of cadre deployment, preferential procurement, et cetera, et cetera, because um, said Alex Weiss also had the problem. He had to just get a copy of car ownership so that the, so his car could be sold. Um, and he was, he was in and out very quickly, but... He he would have to collect it 
two weeks or three weeks from the date he was there. Now, to my mind, if you've got a half decent computer system, he, they should be able to print it out there and then. You pay your money, you get your, your document, and you go away. It seems that at every turn in servicing what the country needs to run properly, the government just doesn't get it. It doesn't. It just doesn't meet our needs. Morris? Yeah, and I think it also comes down to, I mean, the government's monopoly. You can't go somewhere else mm. and, um, you know, apply for passport somewhere else. But, I mean, that said, the government did start allowing people to apply for passports at uh, various banks. And uh, I remember, I mean, when I, went, I applied at uh, FNB when I applied for my passport the last time, and it was all very quick and very efficient. And uh, I think it was our old uh, colleague, Franz Grenet, he said uh, what was happening was that the people who were at the various banks were from uh, Home Affairs. They mm. weren't bank employees. They are people from, mm. the, from Home Affairs. And he said there was this kind of cross-pollination, or well, cross-pollination, there was this kind of osmosis from the FMB or the bank employees towards the Home Affairs people. And instead of the Home Affairs culture starting to permeating the bank, you know, being lazy and not really putting the customer first, it was the other way around. Mm. You know, the, the Home Affairs employees who were working at the banks were, you know, putting the customer first, their, and their workspaces looked clean. They weren't playing solitaire instead of helping, a, you know, somebody applying for their passports. So I thought uh, that was pretty interesting. And just, I mean, for uh, to to give some kudos to Home Affairs, uh, last time I applied for my passports, I applied for it, and four days later it was, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, available. I could go collect it. But this is all before the COVID uh, epidemic or pandemic, so I don't know if that had something to do with it. Uh, and I just want to comment on Harry's point about uh, large numbers of young people and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's actually a very important point and uh, also a problem in Africa as a whole, not just South Africa. Uh, countries, they go through something called the demographic dividend. And that's when they have large numbers of young people who also have economic opportunities. And then they start, uh, you know, spending money and saving. Then a country has lots of money to be able to put into infrastructure and then this kind of virtuous circle. The problem in South Africa and Africa as a whole, there are large numbers of young people. They don't have these economic opportunities. So it's Africa could miss out on this demographic dividend because Africa is the only continent in the world where the population is growing, but it's also starting to, uh, that, that growth is slowing. But places like the more developed, more richer places in Africa, such as South Africa and Botswana and Namibia, we're already at a fertility rate that's barely at a replacement level. The average mm -hmm. African woman only has about 2.4 kids, and you should be having about 2.1 kids just to keep the population steady. So... Africa could miss out on this demographic dividend, which has helped places, you know, most of uh, Asia and so on in Europe uh, 60, 70 years ago, where large numbers of young people are entering the workforce, but they have uh, economic opportunities, they have, uh, you know, ways to advance in the economy, and then they start making money, they save this money, and as I say, it, goes, it can go into infrastructure and so on, but Africa is going to miss out on that, and that's going to be a tragedy, not just for, I mean, you know, not just in abstract terms, but for all the people that live on this continent and in this country. Mm. No, I think I think that's that's absolutely right. And it's you know, you, you get a lot of the sort of what I call the whinging from Africa about how the West deals with them or talks to them or whatever. But in fact, it's it's what essentially is instead of grabbing the nettle, there's a tendency, there's it seems to be this ongoing tendency to want to be given. Uh, whether it's access to the Security Council or whether it's access to the IMF that should sit on the board. But countries like South Africa have become countries that just take and demand and to some extent act, act the victim. And th you, you don't grow acting the victim. Anyway, uh, now that uh, our audience member Andrew has uh, earned his uh, stripes by reminding us to be liked... <laughs> Um, the final item I'd like to look at is the difference between protesting against the vagaries of the oil industry and in England and the protesting here. Extinction Rebellion found its way into the headquarters of Standard Bank in Rosebank, sort of one person at a time, and then blew a whistle and everyone sat down and protested peacefully with placards saying that Standard Bank is, a, is terrible for um, loaning money to oil companies or oil exploration companies. And then instead of sort of sitting there and the police, as they, we know that has happened in London, where protesters can kind of sit and block a highway for a considerable period of time, inconveniencing most of London, the security personnel of Standard Bank ejected them. 
Um, and there has been much gnashing of teeth and uh, declaring, you know, Standard Bank to be some evil capitalist pig entity that has ruined the peaceful protest of a, of a just cause by removing them bodily from the foyer of Standard Bank. And one poor protester sort of got bonked on his head uh, accidentally, sort of dropped on his head by a security person that had to be attended to in the sick bay. Fortunately, apparently, he was back out with his colleagues uh, soon afterwards. Um, Harry, what, uh, what do you make of it? I mean, I was quite amused by the sheer, I suppose it's self-righteousness on the part of the protesters that they could just walk into private property and hold a protest. Now, I'm not sure if they'd ask nicely whether, whether the Standard Bank would have let them protest inside the property, and they could certainly have uh, got permission to protest outside of the property. Aren't they being a little bit sort of, you know, who who are they to think that they can protest on property the way they they, they chose to do? Or am I being a bit unfair? No, I think um, uh, if you um, interfere with someone's, uh, you know, private property, then you can expect some some force. Um, but I'm more concerned about what they're trying to espouse, the, the, the uh, ideology that they, they have, the, this idea that renewable energy is going to be the, the savior of our, our, our energy crisis. And that, um, you know, we have these huge climate um, uh, rights activist movements in, in Europe, but the reason why Europe is also seeing high energy price increases, you know, partly due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also because renewable energy has proven to be quite um, un unreliable. And um, because of that, you've seen a spike in, 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 in energy prices and electricity mm. prices. Um, and I also think that, you know, South Africa and other African countries should use what they they have in abundance, which is their mineral resources, including coal, in order to to develop the way uh, Western countries have developed. And you, what what we can do now as well as we can focus more on nuclear. Nuclear is a much more safer and cleaner uh, energy source. But I think it's it's problematic to to completely. Um, expect poor countries to not use what they they have an advantage of, of. They they that it's one of the few advantages that we do have. You know that we can help to propel our economies forward to to create new opportunities for for poor families um, and and develop the way um, Western countries have. So. Um, yeah, I uh, I think that's that's kind of like where my where I have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. um, Maris, isn't Harry uh, right in that? In the sense that we will and we do have renewables, but given particularly the dreadful state we're in and the hole we have to climb out of, we cannot expect to not use oil or coal for for the foreseeable future to make that developmental desire possible. Yeah, especially a place uh, like South Africa. I mean, I think on a per capita basis, we are actually pretty bad polluters, but on an absolute basis, we nowhere compared to uh, a lot of the West. And actually, the the real big polluters in the world are uh, China and India. But you don't see people like Extension Rebellion protesting yeah. outside the Chinese or the Indian embassies, which is I think is quite telling. And I mean, this is quite a complex uh, subject. I mean, you know, I have some sympathy with... Um, people who are quite worried about the environment. I do think we humans are damaging it uh, quite badly. But, you know, I've always said it's, uh, if you are somebody who's living in the Eastern Cape in some godforsaken village where 90% of people aren't working, say, look, we, we can't build this factory because we've got to save the polar bears. You mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of people, but at the same time, polar bears are also important, but so are jobs for people. So I think we need to get that balance. And, but I think I've also said it before, humans are innovative. Uh, we've we've come through crises before because of solutions. You know, I mean, going back 200 or 300 years, whenever Malthus was speaking about the Malthusian crisis and all that kind of thing, saying soon we're never going to have enough uh, 
we won't be able to feed everybody and everybody's going to die of starvation. Mm -hmm. And we have far more people living on the planet today than when he made that prediction. And uh, our population is going to start, human population is going to start shrinking from about 2050, actually. But still, yeah, so I think humans are innovative. We'll find a way to get through this. You know, we'll, we'll still be able to produce energy, which doesn't pollute. We'll be able to feed everybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there'll be some uh, missteps on the way, but uh, humans have got through worse situations before, and I'm confident we'll get through this one. Mm. I think we're talking about... Um rationality and common sense not uh, not not anything more exotic well judging by the comments it's uh, standard bank one protesters nil and on that note um i commend you to enjoy the rugby tomorrow and uh, hopefully that uh, the spring rocks end up on the right side of the uh, of the of, of the scoreboard Thank you very much for joining us. Nick will be back after the long weekend on Tuesday. And, uh, you know, Heritage Day is on Sunday. Just don't appropriate somebody else's culture. <laughs>